It's the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network, brought to you, of course, by the good folks at Casamigos Tequila. Casamigos Tequila, brought to you by those who drink it. We get ready for a Game 5. There was no reason to really review anything that went on in Game 4. Game 4 was the game we all expected on Friday night. We didn't get it on Friday night because Indiana did not get off to a regular start. When they inserted their bench guys, which they do in the first quarter of each game, they did nothing. McConnell, Toppin, they did nothing in game three. They were struggling to score for the only time in the series. The bench went kaput that night, and the Knicks, into the body of that game, were shooting over 60% from three as they built a nine-point lead in the fourth quarter. Then they went a little cold from three. Indiana hit some shots, and they went on to a win. And then yesterday, when the Knicks tried to answer the early surge, you got the first surge, which the Knicks held off. Then they go and they put McConnell and Toppin in, and they take off. And now they've opened up a cushion. And when the Knicks tried to battle back, they had nothing. Uh... Neither of their scorers, and that is, of course, uh, Brunson and Dante, they were short rim and everything from outside. They went one for 12 in the first quarter. They missed all their three-point shots. Now they've opened up a huge lead, and the Knicks were steps. The Knicks are built on their defense. They're built on their effort. And last night, yesterday afternoon, they were a step short. They were a step slow. They did not get out on the three-point shooters. They did not get to the loose balls. They did not get to the offensive rebounds. They had nothing. And the advantage that they got out of that game was they got some rest. That's the best thing that could have happened was them calling the dogs off in the third quarter and giving everybody the rest of the game off so that Hart and Brunson and Dante – Uh, and Hartenstein got rest in the game. That was important that that happened. It was was critical that that happened. And here's what you take from the two games in Indiana. Not very much as we await word on OG for game five. Now, I could tell you, they told you last night that OG hasn't even tried to run yet. He hasn't been out of the pool yet. I would think it's a very big long shot that he will play in game five. That means the Knicks are going to have to win with what they have. That's it. Now, what they take from the two games in Indiana is only this. Two things. One, that they can use Burks in this series. He's a professional. He will compete. He can score. They can now fit him into the rotation to make up for one of the bodies lost. Now, he doesn't make up for OG. Nothing can. Knicks are 26-5 and five with OG in the lineup. He is an incredible cog. As I've told you many times, Hart took them to one level, and then OG took them to the next level. They can't. They're not the same team without him. It's going to be hard to win this series without him doesn't mean they can't now. They're going to get a big lift at home, and they just got to get this game into the fourth quarter and just win it on will and guts because they have more of that than Indiana does. Indiana doesn't have a whole lot of guts. Indiana doesn't have a whole lot of heart. They have offensive talent, though, and they have a really good player in Halliburton. And that's the other thing that has to be taken out of the two games in Indiana. The Knicks now cannot fool with Halliburton anymore. They have got to contain him. He cannot have all these open threes. He cannot kill you with his dribble penetration. And both Halliburton and McConnell are killing you with their dribble penetration and their pick and roll stuff. In the last three games, Halliburton is six. He is seven of 11, six for 16, and four for 10 from from three. 
Yesterday, he only played 27 minutes. He scored 20 points. He had 20 points in 27 minutes. He was 4 for 10 from 3. And he had 6 rebounds and 5 assists. His assists have been down in this series because of the fact that he is now knows that he needs to be a primary scorer. He needs to be a primary scorer, and he's not afraid to be that. Hey, guy took 16 threes in game three. 16! He knows what his job is now. It's to score. His job usually is as the facilitator. He now is going to play minutes with McConnell so they can use both of their ability to dribble penetrate. But McConnell becomes the playmaker. Halliburton becomes the scorer when they're on the floor together. And they will be on the floor together. The Knicks have got to neutralize the bench at least some, or that is what gives them an enormous lift. It did in game one, it did in game two, it did in game four, it didn't in game three, and the Knicks could have easily won game three. The Knicks have to get max performance out of the three Nova guys. They have nothing else. They can get a well-rounded 35 minutes out of Hartenstein who can give them 10 points and give them eight boards and give them five assists. They're not going to get anything out of a chewer. They can get points out of McBride. They can get some points out of Burks. That's fine. But Dante and Brunson and Hart have got to score basically 80 points for them to win. There's no way around it otherwise. At least 75. Now, they've done a better job on Brunson the last two games. Plus, Brunson's on a little bit of a gimpy foot. We don't know to what extent because he's a tough-as-nails guy. We really don't know, but we do know this. We do know that Nesmith, who's an athletic guy, now, he's not a better defender than Obrey is, and Obrey was a good defender in that series for the first couple of games, and then Brunson figured it out. Brunson has to figure it out here. And what the Knicks have to do is they have to set really hard screens for Brunson, and Brunson has to come off the screen like a house of fire, looking to score as soon as he turns the corner off the screen. Up with the shot, into the paint, right away. That's what he did in the Philly series. He made that first step count. They couldn't catch up on the switch to the first step. He's got to do the same thing to Indiana because to win – He's going to have to score 35 points in Game 5. I don't think they can survive unless Dante has another one of these insane games like he did in Game 3. I don't know that they can survive without him getting 35 anymore. They've become that needy for his scoring because hot scoring comes on energy. It doesn't come on talent. Hart scores because he out-efforts everybody. He gets a putback. He beats you down the floor. The only guys in the league who beat more people down the floor than Hart are LeBron James and the Freak. That's it. No one else in the league does it. Go end to end like he does. Grab a rebound and go. And he gets layups that way. He gets four or five of them just on basic effort. Forget his game four. His game four was a rest game. And that's what clearly, if you notice the minutes, that's what clearly... Tibbs had his eye on. Tibbs was doing two things yesterday. He was looking to rest his Villanova guys. And he was looking, he wanted to see some minutes to see if any of the Knicks, other than Burks, that he put on the floor showed them enough that they could compete for minutes and actually go out there for minutes in the key part of the next three games. And this is probably going to take three games. If you're the Knicks, hope for a game seven in the series because if it's six, it's probably not going to be Knicks. Because I'm telling you right now, I don't think OG's coming back in the series. Not with any strength. I think he's hurt. 
bad enough, badly enough that he's not going to be a factor in the series. I hope I'm wrong. I hope there's, you know, a little bit of a Willis Reed coming. I just don't think from what I saw and what I've heard that he's making any strides. The first word you were hearing was two-week injury. Hamstrings, when they get strained like that, are hard to heal. And he's not a quick healer. He hasn't been a quick healer. So what you have now, folks, and I'm talking now to this generation of Knicks fans, you haven't had, you think you have, you haven't had what you're going to have tomorrow night in your time watching the Knicks. Because you have to go back to before you were born, a lot of you, to get a game and a New York night like you're going to get tomorrow night. There are times when the garden has a life of its own. Tomorrow night is going to be one of those times where it's going to be that kind of New York night. The kind that you've heard about. The kind that they played with Ewing and Riley. The, time, the kind that they never played since. But now you're deep enough into the playoffs and you're staring and dreaming about a conference final against the Celtics. And despite the Celtics not showing up every game, they'll be there. Don't think they'll lose another game to the Cavs. They had their one game that they spit out. They seem to have one every series. They're a weird team. But they're a talented team. But you are going to have something tomorrow night that you have not had, that you've heard about, that you've seen when you watch some of those highlights of Knicks Bulls and Knicks Pacers and Knicks Heat. And you see Ewing and Starks and Oakley and Jordan and Pippen and Reggie Miller and the heat, and everything they brought, and the intensity, and the ferocity, and just the noise level, and the passion in the building. We had this for a long time here. We had it all the Riley years. And I have made this statement before. In my lifetime, of being on the air in this town, and that spanned 35 years. I mean, I'm still on the air, but I mean, I'm talking about in the days of when I was doing five and a half hours every day. The biggest loss this city suffered was not the retirement of a great player. That's going to happen. There's a natural cost to that, whether you're talking about Mickey Mantle, whether you're talking about Lawrence Taylor, whether you're talking about Derek Jeter or Mariano Rivera, there comes a a start and a great middle and a finish. But the biggest loss that this town ever suffered was when Riley faxed in his resignation and went to Greece because he took all that passion and all that toughness, and all that intensity, and all that success with them. And the Knicks never got it back. They had their moments with Van Gundy. The remnants were still left. They went to a final they couldn't win against San Antonio. They had their moments. But they never got back to what they had in the Riley years. Not on the same level. And now, with this team and everything that this team has put together and this team's cohesiveness and its toughness and the intensity and the hunger that they bring, this team gives you everything it has every minute it's on the floor. That's special. Great teams don't give you that. 
Special teams give you that. This team gives you that. And like I said, tomorrow, game five, banged up, beat up, shorthanded. Your team's going to absolutely need that building to help carry them to a victory. Tomorrow night, you go in that building and you feel like you're part of the action because the intensity and the noise and what you bring is a factor. And that's that special night that that building can produce. And that building has laid dormant for so many years in the last two decades in the springtime. And I always said, I wish you could experience what we experienced when that building was pulsating in May and June. Well, now you get to experience that. You get it in full vibe. You get it in full flower tomorrow night. You get one of those New York nights you've heard about and you've read about, but you've never experienced. So if you're one of the ones who's lucky enough to be in that building tomorrow, cherish it. These nights don't come around very often. This team is tough enough. If this game's going to be won on guts and will, Nick's going to win it because they're the tougher team. They're the more more cohesive team. And they are a lot braver than the Pacers are. I put Halliburton aside. He's a really good player. The Pacers don't have a lot that you're afraid of other than Halliburton. And the Knicks have got to start to control Halliburton a little bit more or they're going to lose the series because of that. He can't just go wild on them. Because that negates everything Brunson brings. And if he breaks even with Brunson, Knicks lose. Brunson has to be a positive. He can't be a break-even. If it's a break-even, he and Halliburton, Knicks going home. Knicks need every ounce of everything they can muster tomorrow and everything they can muster from the building. That's how desperate this has become because they're shorthanded. They're banged up. They're tired. And the other team's got numbers. And the other team's coming off two wins. And the other team's figuring, let's get a win here tonight and get back and close this thing down. Because if you were Indiana, that's what you'd be thinking right now. We got them on their heels. We got them on the run. They're banged up. They're beat up. Let's put them away. Enjoy it. It doesn't come around very often. Now, tonight, game five in the building with the Rangers. For the Rangers, it's a little different here. It's don't let this team have a life. Right now, the Rangers have dominated this series. They've dominated with their special teams. They've dominated with their goaltender. Carolina survived game four. They didn't win it. They survived it. They got out of there alive. But don't give them a chance. I remember going back to 94, which we seemed to harken back to all the time. The Rangers were up 3-1 against Vancouver. And we were in the building for the game five, Dog and I. And all we talked about was, hey, after the, Knicks, after the Rangers win tonight, you know, celebrate the right way. Don't break up the city. You know, there was a lot of talk about that and everything else. The show, don't, in a very stupid way, and we should be blamed for it, was more about how to celebrate the championship than it was about game five. And you know what? Vancouver won the game. And we went all the way back to Vancouver, and Vancouver won game six and acted like they had just won the Stanley Cup as they tore the town apart that night. They were rocking the cars after game six like it was over, like they had won. It was crazy getting out of the building that night. And then game seven got really scary. And that series got really hard. 
Don't let that happen. Get it over with tonight. Get it over in five and get on to Florida, which has got a 3-1 lead on Boston right now. A couple other things to get to here. Number one. Mets were, you know, it's, a, it's funny with the Mets. They have been on the brink a couple of times this year of really just going down the abyss. A couple of times. And every time it happens, second game of the doubleheader against the Tigers, every time it happens, they seem to pull something out. Last night, they're about to get swept by the Braves, who have been dominating them, and they're putting this putting up on the board, uh, on the TV screen last night. Braves 19 and 6 against the Mets in the last 25 games. Braves have a lead here in the ninth. Mets look anemic. Can't score in the series. About to get swept, dusted away with the Phillies coming in who are, you know, playing great baseball. Suddenly look like one of those times again where oh no, the Mets are going to just slide away. They don't have their clothes to the Braves because they used them the last couple of days. They worried about the no-hitter the day before, and they didn't get that anyway. And McNeil looks bad at the plate and then drags a bunt for a base hit. They bunt him over to second. And Nimmo didn't even start the game because of the injury. Comes in, battles the lefty who finally hangs the slider, and Nimmo hits the ball out of the park. And the Mets, instead of getting swept, win another one of these games. They have had as many walk-offs as any team in baseball this year. They have four walk-off wins, so do the Orioles. This team that is really sc- scrapped for runs, going through the Lindor slump, going through the Alonzo slump, waited for Martinez, has gotten a good productive, especially in the RBI department, from Nimmo at the top of the lineup. And Nimmo's got power now. He really does. And that was a big home run last night. Mets needed that win as they get ready for the Phillies here. Every time this year when this team looks like it's about to go right down the drain, it comes up with some heroics and wins the game. It did that again last night. That was a big win. An unlikely win, and they've had some of those this year. It's a weird team. It really is, but it's hanging hanging on in a very tough division where the Phillies and the Braves have big-time records, where Washington's better than you thought, Miami's terrible. And the Mets are kind of hanging in there. That was a big win. The Yankees just keep winning series, which, you know what? As you go along and just flip the series and just keep winning series, the Yankees just keep winning series and just keep showing you and illustrating consistent power. And they didn't have that last year. They didn't have the depth of the lineup. They didn't have the lefty power. They didn't have Verdugo. They didn't have a healthy Rizzo. They didn't have Soto. Now they have that. And they have consistent power. And that's going to carry them very comfortably to the playoffs, and then we'll see where things are. But that's the first thing that had to happen after an 82-80 and season. And they're showing you that. They're showing you consistency, and they're showing you consistent power. All week last week, we thought there was going to be no derby horses in the Preakness. Didn't look like Mystic Dan, who was a perfect trip winner in the Preakness, in the, in the derby, was going to go in the Preakness. And I can tell you this, this trainer, Kenny McPeak, didn't want any part of the Preakness. Didn't want to run his horse on two weeks. When he ran him on two weeks, once he ran terribly. He's not a big horse. He knows he was a perfect trip winner. He knows the Preakness is going to come up tough with the Baffert horses there. And his owners wanted to go. They're traditionalists. So now they're going to the Preakness. Best thing that could have happened to the Preakness 
for the Preakness to matter, they have to have the Derby winner and the thoughts of a Triple Crown, at least in the discussion, in the minutes leading up to the race. They have that now with Mystic Dan. He's in the race. I don't think he'll win. I don't think he'll be on the board, but that doesn't matter. What matters is he went to the race and he competed because that means that the Preakness matters. And if you're a horse racing fan or you like the Triple Crown, you got to watch it because there's only one horse that can do that, and that's the Derby winner, and he's in the race. So that gives justification and credibility to the Preakness so they can take a big sigh of relief that they have the Derby winner in the race, which they do. Now, the PGA this week, the second of the majors, the least prestigious of the majors. But the PGA might not have the best golfer in the world. They will have Rory off a win yesterday at the Wells Fargo at Quail Hollow. Rory likes Quail Hollow. He's won there four times. And he played really well and very unshoffly yesterday. But Scotty Scheffler, as we know, has been waiting since before the Masters for the birth of his first child. Our information is that it hasn't come yet. I doubt he's going to be leaving his wife, who's probably moments away from having the baby. I don't know Scheffler's plans, but it probably doesn't include the PGA this week, and that will leave a big void if the best player in the world by a significant margin right now is not in the PGA. And it doesn't look like he will be. So golf doesn't have enough problems. Now it has to have a major without the best player in the world who has dominated the sport this year, winning four out of five weeks before he took his little vacation. And winning four out of five weeks on the PGA Tour is unheard of. That's Tiger-like. Especially when you include the players and the masters in those wins. That is Tiger-like. But I doubt he'll be there. That will leave a void. So Mystic Dan goes to the Preakness. Scotty Schiffler probably doesn't go to the second leg of the Big Four, the PGA, which begins Thursday at Valhalla in Louisville. But the headline, of course, the Garden tonight with the Rangers, the Garden tomorrow with the Knicks. OG, is there any hope? I wouldn't hold out a lot. I don't know if we're going to get a cameo or a Willis Reed. If you don't know what a Willis Reed is, look it up. Um... If the Knicks are going to win this series, they got to win this game. It's hard to see them without an OG losing three straight games in this series than going bound Indiana and winning game six without them. More likely, they win this game, they get beaten game six, and they come back and find a way next Sunday to win. Who knows, maybe he makes a recovery, we don't know. We haven't heard any word definitively yet on him, but it doesn't look good for game five. If we hear anything more on OG, we'd obviously update, but we don't expect to hear anything until game time tomorrow. And I would not expect him to be a major factor, even if he does put the uniform on, which we don't know that he is going to do. Because all that Tibbs said yesterday was that he hadn't even been out of the pool yet. He hadn't run at all. Not a good sign. Tomorrow we will put up a same-game parlay again for game five. We will have that for you once we find out who's healthy, who's playing, and where we are. We'll do that uh, tomorrow, so look for that. And remember, uh, look for all the different promotions they're running. Go to the uh, Bet Rivers app for all that. And we'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks for listening to the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network.